your table, surrounded by your glory, in your presence, that's where I always want to be, oh my Lord, I just want to be with you. Father, speak to us, O God. 
This fifth day of the year 2019, we want to bring you thanks. We want to bring you thanks for the first four, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We want to bring you thanks for the reaffirmation or the instituting, in some cases, of our covenants with you. The covenant of divine protection and no loss, divine direction and guidance, divine health and healing, divine prosperity and abundance. And today, this fifth day, we come to dedicate unto you the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit every Saturday in the year 2019, as well as to enter into or reaffirm and re-strengthen our covenant of long life and godly order in death. O thou unto whom all creation lift their eyes and they suffer no shame, give ear to our cries, consider our meditations, bow your heavens, come down, enter into this covenant with us, unto us, with us, and for our generations, in Jesus' mighty name. Awesome Spirit of the living God, we absolutely rely on you to lead us into the fullness of the counsel of the Most High God for our lives, for this covenant, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Please be seated, and can I ask that we fill all front chairs all front chairs please let us fill all front chairs let us fill all front chairs please my helper oh my helper my helper oh my helper there is something that makes me come into your presence, my helper. Please, I'm waiting for us to fill the front chairs. My helper, oh, my helper. My helper, oh, my helper. There is something that makes me Come into your presence, my helper. Hallelujah. What is the basis of our coming before God? to make a covenant what gives us the right as mere mortals to believe we have a right to ask the almighty God to enter into covenant with us 2nd Chronicles 29 verses 6 to 10 for our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. And they have shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem and he had delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing as ye see with your eyes. This is someone testifying I have observed. My progenitors, the leaders, the people who had been before us. Abandoned fellowship with God. Turned to gods that are no gods. Stop worshipping and provoked Jehovah to anger. The results of this are evident in that there is problem 
in Judah. There is problem in Jerusalem. Verse 9 goes further to say, For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. I have observed the consequence of the disobedience of my progenitors. Then he says in verse 10, Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. God didn't invite him to make a covenant. He observed problems that came because people walked contrary to the covenant. And he decided, I will call on God and make a covenant. You are here tonight to call on God. Most of us, two generations behind you, your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, you will find your people standing before a deity, an idol, a God that is no God, worshipping in idolatry. So the things spoken of in verses 6 to 9 apply to most of us. It's foundational in our upbringing. But thank God we are free moral agents. We have a right to choose. And you have chosen tonight. It is in your heart. You are here tonight to call on the God of Israel to make a fresh covenant with you on behalf of yourself and those that be of you. That God will hear you tonight. That God will listen to you tonight. And a new thing will start in your life and in your generations in Jesus' mighty name. Remember that whatever you discern from the scriptures as a divine pattern and receive it as a revelation and claim and apply it to your own life, it will find expression. Why? The Lord says whatever we see is given to us as an example in the word. And if we line up with the examples we see, we will receive the same results as those who are given to us for an example. So in Job 5 from verse 19 on to verse 27, we see from six calamities he will rescue you. In seven, and I'm reading NIV version, in seven no harm will befall you. In famine, and uh, it's good that two people said amen. In famine he will ransom you from death. And in battle from the stroke of the sword. You will be protected from the lash of the tongue. And you need not fear when destruction comes. You will laugh at destruction and famine. And need not fear the beasts of the earth. For you will have a covenant with the stones of the field. And the wild animals will be at peace with you. You will know that your tent is secure. You will take stock of your property and find nothing missing. You will know that your children will be many and your descendants like the grass of the earth. You will come to the grave in full vigor like sheaves gathered in season. We have examined this and it is true. So hear it and do what? Apply it to yourself. Claim it for yourself. Confess it upon yourself. Believe and receive it unto yourself and unto your generations and it shall be so. That is why every year I repeat the same teaching. That is why every quarter we reaffirm the same thing. The more you hear of it, the greater the depth of your understanding and belief the more it is true unto you and unto your generations. Am I talking to somebody here? To the Jews whose Messiah has not come, they are still waiting for him. Yet, because they receive it as their history, because what you have as your Old Testament is Jewish history, they study it in school. So they read it as a text in school and they believed it and it's working for them. You are in a superior covenant. Our Messiah has been sacrificed even the lamb of our passover if what they are receiving as a shadow 
is efficacious in their lives, how much more will it be efficacious in your life? Which is why Jehovah says that I will do with the Gentiles something that will make my own people jealous so that they will come back to me. You are the one he's talking to. As you receive these covenants, download them and buy into them. I see your death, your generations, your family so transformed that the people of the Lord in whom he said he will bless all the families of the earth will become jealous of what God is doing in your own life. In Jesus mighty name. So hear it today. Receive it today. Apply it to yourself. And it will work for you. In Jesus mighty name. Concerning this covenant we are here for. What covenant is it? The covenant of long life. And godly order in death. Number one. Length of days. Number two. Godly order in death. What do we mean by godly order in death? Length of days, everybody understands, I'm sure. It's only a matter of what you accept as length of days. And today, by the grace of God, he will help us with a clearer understanding of what he means by length of days. But what do you understand by godly order in death? By reason of this covenant, you're not permitted to die by the wayside. I didn't hear your amen. By reason of this covenant, you are not permitted to die where vultures will eat your carcass. By reason of this covenant, you are not permitted to die carelessly without putting your affairs in order. You see, we are going to look at those that walked with God in covenant. See how they lived. See how long they lived. See whether they died carelessly. See whether they died in places where their bodies were not found and were not honored. Am I talking to somebody here? The Bible says of Jezebel that she died and dogs ate her flesh. That is not the kind of death we are talking about. There is a godly order in death. I know that the spirit is departed. But even the carcass is worthy of some little respect in memory of the one that is departed. Am I talking to somebody here? Praise the living God. So I'm not talking of death at 180 but vultures ate his body. No. There is a godly order in death. This order also you will see in it. Who died first? And at what age? Did the younger one die before the older one? Am I talking to somebody here? So let's look at how God dealt with those who walked in covenant with him. And if you discern the pattern, accept the pattern for yourself, walk with him as they walked with him in this superior covenant, then anything God did with them and for them, he will do with you and do for you in Jesus' mighty name. So concerning this covenant, King David, a man after God's heart, declared as follows in Psalms 21. Psalms 21 verses 1 to 4. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. Thou hast given him his heart's desire. God will give you your heart's desire today. And has not withholden the request of his lips. The request you make to him today for yourself and your generation, he will grant it to you. I didn't hear your amen. For thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness. Now this is old English. Preventest means surrounded. You succored him with the blessings of goodness. Thou settest a crown of pure gold on his head. And verse 4 says, he asked life of thee and thou gavest it to him even length of days forever and ever if he did if he did it in the old testament tonight you will ask life of him he'll give you blessings of goodness set a crown of gold on your head and give you length of days to satisfy you in the name of jesus christ let us recognize and get divine perspective. Death is a defeated foe. Death is a foe that Christ has dealt with. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 in the God's word version. God saved us 
and called us to be holy not because of what we had done but because of his own plan and kindness before the world began god planned that christ jesus would show us god's kindness now with the coming of our savior christ jesus he has revealed it christ has destroyed death can somebody repeat with me christ has destroyed death and through the good news he has brought eternal life into full view praise the living god i said praise the living god you know in the book of revelations john saw him and he said fear not i am he who was dead and i am li alive again forevermore and i have in my hands the keys of death and hell the keys of death and hell are not in the hands of your enemy they are in the hands of the one who laid down his life for you to have life and have it more abundantly am i talking to somebody here so you can't die carelessly your amen sounds like last year's soup you can be harvested carelessly by the spirit of death he has destroyed death death is only a gateway an access way a transit point a door that one must pass through at a certain stage of his life to access another realm the realm between us and passing over to permanently dwell in the spirit realm there's a doorway that has to be traversed it is called the doorway of death it is only a door am i talking to somebody here in hosiah 13 verse 4 it says i will ransom them from the power of the grave i will redeem them from death oh death i will be thy plagues oh grave i will be thy destruction repentance shall be hid from mine eyes jehovah is fully set upon and in dying and resurrecting dealt with the spirit of death for you and i yet however for as many as not as are not aware of this that many people that number of people are still bound by the spirit of the fear of death i'm a deliverance minister the biggest problem we have in deliverance is not the spirit of death it's the spirit of the fear of death many people actually open the doors to the spirit of death by first of all receiving the spirit of the fear of death am i communicating with anyone here and the thing about fear is f-e-a-r fear is evidence false evidence appearing real so here you are your imagination is running riot about death because you had gunshots outside and it is that fear that will attract the spirit of death that is still outside like a magnet to home in on the person that is fearful of death am i communicating with anybody here the spirit of the fear of death is a worse enemy than the spirit of death hebrews 2 verse 14 contemporary english version we are people of flesh and blood that is why jesus became one of us he died to destroy the devil who had power over death why did he die to destroy the devil who had power over death so in dying he destroyed the hold of the power over death that the devil had over us but he also died verse 15 says to rescue all of us who live each day in fear of dying he has dealt with the spirit of death but many are living in the fear of dying god's word version puts that verse 15 this way hebrews 2 15 in this way he will free those who were slaves all their lives because they were afraid of dying there are many who are lifelong slaves to the fear of death may the hold of the spirit of the fear of death be broken from your life in jesus mighty name 
And that Revelations, I quoted Revelations 1 from verse 13, then on to 17 and 18. I'll read just 13, then 17 and 18. God's Word version says this. Revelations 1, 13. There was someone like the Son of Man. This is John narrating what he saw in the vision. There was someone like the Son of Man among the lampstands. He was wearing a robe that reached his feet. He wore a gold belt around his waist. Verse 17. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. Then he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, but now I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and hell. I repeat, you cannot die when the enemy wants you to die. Your amen sounds like something is wrong with it. I said, your life is not in the hands of hired assassins. They will point the gun and pull the trigger, but the bullet will not fly. John Hagee stood on the pulpit preaching years ago. And a demented man entered into his church, walked straight to the pulpit and pulled a revolver and emptied all six shots point blank at John Hagee. They captured the man and nothing happened to John Hagee. So, when the ballistic experts came in, where were you standing? Here. Where was the man standing? There. They put a figure there at the height of the man and put threads or laser beams to everywhere the bullet hole impacted on the background. And every one of the bullets passed through John Hagee, but there was no wound. By trajectory, every one of the six bullets that embedded on the altar behind him passed through him, but there was no scratch on his body. Can somebody say that God is my God? Your life is not in the hands of the man that has a knife and is coming after you. It's not in the hands of the man that said, I will poison you. It's not in the hands of the man that says, 2019, you will not see the end of the year. It doesn't matter what men say. If this God be for you, the one that has the keys of death and hell, nobody can take your life until he says, it is okay, you can go. Your, your life is not in the hands of your enemies. Praise the living God. So look at your neighbor and say, fear not. Fear not what men say they will do to you. Fear not those who say they will take your life. Fear not those who go about taking the lives of others. Your own case is different. No wonder in John 19 verse 30. Jesus himself. The Bible says of him, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The English of gave up means willingly he surrendered his life. Matthew 27 verse 50 says it this way from Matthew 27 50 to 53 Jesus when he had cried again with a loud voice yielded surrendered up the ghost and behold the veil of the temple was rained in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. The key word here is he yielded up the ghost. The living Bible version says he dismissed his spirit. For those of you who have been in class in primary schools of the kind some of us went to during the civil war when we were in the village at the end of class you sing the song and speaking in tongues now when you finish singing that vernacular song the teacher will now say class dismissed 
Until he says it, you don't get up, you don't leave. Jesus dismissed his spirit. In fact, he said, into thy hand, my father, I commend my spirit. So he told the spirit where he was posting it to. Then he dispatched it. And he said, like my father sent me, so send I you. Nobody can take your life. He says in John 10, 17 and 18, Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me. Hello? No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. If he had it, he said, so send I you. You too have the right and the power to say, not yet. You too have the right and the power in Christ Jesus. Authority to deliver, let go of your life. I beg you, don't because of fear, let go of your life prematurely. Am I talking to somebody here? Fear is the policeman of the devil that paralyzes Christians. And they begin to behave like ordinary men. Ye are gods. But ye shall die like men. If fear gets a hold of you. Am I talking to somebody here? It shall not be your portion. God's word version says. I have authority to give my life. And I have the authority to take my life back again. And that same authority. He said in John 20, 21. Peace be with you. As my father had sent me, so I am sending you with the same authority. So you can boldly declare and speak to death. Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? Open your mouth and declare with me. No power of wickedness can take my life in the year 2019 in Jesus mighty name praise the living God no wonder apostle Paul was able to declare in 2nd Corinthians 5 and verse 6 2nd Corinthians 5 verses 6 and on to 8 good news Bible version so we are always full of courage may what you have heard make you full of courage we know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord's home. For our life is a matter of faith, not of sight. Your life is a matter of what? Have faith. God is not a man, he can't lie. Verse 8, we are full of courage and would much rather prefer to leave our home in the body and be at home with the Lord. Why? Because we know that death is a gateway for us. Not to hell. Not to perdition. But to mansions that he went to prepare for us. Am I talking to somebody here? Pastor Deboye tells a story of an elderly woman who was sick when he traveled. And when he came back, he sent message ahead and said, Mama, I heard that you're sick. I'm coming to the hospital to pray for you on so and so day. And on that day, he went to the hospital to pray for her. She received him very well. He finished praying and said, Mama, get well soon and come and join us back in church. And Mama laughed. Mama laughed at him and said, Daddy Gio, I just waited because I heard that you're coming. God has shown me the body prepared and my heavenly mansion. If they did not tell me that you were coming today, I would have been gone by now. I just waited to honor you. Daddy Gio, thank you for coming to pray for me. I will not be coming to church. That night, she departed. That night, she did what? She departed. Quietly. She knew she had seen. I pray for somebody here under the sound of my voice. Every fear of death in your life dies by fire. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, somebody. Our covenant examples in the Bible, therefore, let us look at their patterns and let us model our expectations after what we see. 
For the Bible tells us in Isaiah 51, verse 1. Listen to me, God's word version. You people who pursue what is right and seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were dug. Easy to read version says, you should look at Abraham your father. He is the rock you were cut from. In other words, what is it saying? Look at the patterns with which Jehovah dealt with Abraham. The first one he walked in covenant with. What you discover in the life of Abraham is what he has on offer to you for your own life. Am I talking to somebody here? Am I talking to somebody here? So what can we see about this covenant of long life and godly order in death from the life of Abraham and his wife Sarah? The Bible says of Sarah, talking about when she, her life on earth rather, came to an end. And the Bible says in Genesis 23 verse 1, And Sarah was an hundred and seven and twenty years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died at what age? 127. How old, much older than Sarah was Abraham, if you remember? Exactly 10 years older. Which means that Abraham was how old when Sarah died? 137 years old. The Bible further goes on then to say. In Genesis 25 verse 1. And please take note of the patterns of how old they were before they died. Praise the Lord. And how they died. Genesis 25 verses 1 two five and on then again abraham took a wife and her name was ketura a man of 137 did what remarried and she bare him zimran jokshan medan midian and ishbak and shua how many sons six sons a man Past 137. Still sired. Still fathered. Six more sons. Can somebody say that's vitality? Can somebody say that's vitality? By verse 5 of Genesis 25. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. So he put his estate in order. But unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. So he put his estate in order. He made sure there would be no struggling for his property. He settled the other six children born by Keturah, sent them away while he was alive, established them where they were, and left everything else for the son of promise. He made sure there would be no noise in his house. He put his house in order. And these, verse 7, are the days of Abraham's life which he lived, an hundred, three score, and fifteen years. One hundred and seventy-five years old. That's how old Abraham was before he died. Then Abraham did what? Gave up the ghost. Again, mark the words. It didn't say Abraham died. It said Abraham did what? So he surrendered his spirit. It was a choice. He gave up the ghost and died in a good old age. So giving up the ghost and dying. You die when you give up the ghost. But some people die and the ghost is taken from them. These ones gave up the ghost. Take note of that phrase. Throughout all the lives of all the people we are going to look at as patterns of this covenant. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age. An old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. Praise the Lord. Verse 8 in the New Living Translation says, And he died at a ripe old age. And having lived a long and satisfying 
life. May everyone under the sound of my voice, if Jesus tarries, die at a ripe old age, having lived a long and satisfying life in the name of Jesus Christ. If your amen is loud, may your testimony be so. Praise the living God. Amplified version puts it this way. Abraham's spirit was released. Who released it? Abraham. And he died at a good ample full age. Good ample full old age. An old man satisfied and satiated. And was gathered to his people. Hello. When they give you food to eat, who decides when you're satisfied? Is it not you? If you don't tell them you're satisfied, they will give you a big belly. 